Banks, Super Talk Mississippi, joining us now. Lee Yancey, he's a member of the Mississippi House of Representatives, represents District 74, which incorporates a good bit, good chunk of Rankin County. Good morning there, Representative Yancey. Good morning, Mr. Gibbard. How are you today? Good to see you. Look like you're ready for the golf course. Well, you know, it's hot outside. It is I like hot. to wear short sleeves sometimes when it's hot. <laughs> gotcha. I hear you. We, were just we are in Mississippi. It's I know. not even summertime yet. I know. We were just talking about that, uh, Rhino and I were. It's a little premature for summertime. Well, uh, you got to be bored these days, right? No legislative sessioning going on. Well, you bored? It's You're back to work. It's certainly a different kind of schedule. You know, I'm back okay. to my old job and... <laughs> Uh, advising clients and and looking for new clients and and you know having a great time doing it. Love yeah. love what I do. Good. All right. So this uh, you were obviously intimately involved in this entire medical marijuana situation because um, you serve as the chair of the drug committee in the house, right? That's correct. Yeah. So that uh, responsibility fell to a great extent certainly in the House side, on you, and then Senator Blackwell over in the Senate side. So that deal's done, and uh, now a lot of work is uh, going on to get the program implemented, uh, and that, of course, involves the promulgation of the rules and the regulations necessary to administer and govern the program. That is in accordance with the law. That responsibility falls on the Department of Health. Is that correct for the most part? That's correct for everything except the dispensaries, which falls on the Department of Revenue. Okay. And, right. and if I wanted to know something about any part of this program, I would direct people to the Department of Health website or the Department of Revenue website. Okay. Both have a nice link to a copy of the bill, should you be so inclined to read that. They also have uh, all the regulations that are posted there, the process by which you need to obtain a license for any aspect of the business or to be a practi practitioner who gets a license or um, a patient. You know, once they have received a certification from a practitioner, uh, how they would go about getting their license. And I believe okay. what they want is for everyone to do this online. That is the goal. And uh, do what online? Well, I, let, me, yeah, let, me, let me back up because yeah. you do have to have – so once you get your <laughs> certification – uh, well, if you're applying for a license, you definitely would do that online. License to it, do to grow to to grow. be a cultivator, to be a processor, to be a tester, to be a disposal entity or a transportation entity. Okay. Um, you know, retailer. You you learn how to get your license by looking online. Okay. You know, if you are a patient, you know you are waiting until the practitioners have been licensed. Uh, not only do they have to apply for a license, but they have to, to complete eight hours of continuing education before they can get their license. And uh, once they do, then you would have to have a face-to-face -face visit uh, with a practitioner with whom you have a bona fide relationship with. And then within the scope of their practice, they could certify that you have one of the debilitating conditions that would enable you to qualify for a medical cannabis card. And, um, you know, so you know, the process by which all that's going to happen is going to be spelled out on the Department of Health website. Okay. So just in general, to summarize, you, there, there are a number of players in the supply chain, operators in the supply chain. You just listed them. Mm -hmm. uh, is, and I assume that that is uh, explicitly specified in the law. It itself. is. Is that it right? Is. Okay. It certainly is. So those folks have to be licensed by the state. Uh, to operate a business in any of those those categories within the supply chain, and you listed them: cultivator, tester, uh, transporter, etc. Those have their, and there are rules around how to obtain those licenses and how to qualify for those. And then you've got the consumers, those who seek uh, medical marijuana for relief of uh, of the various symptoms that qualify, the various ailments that qualify. And um, that, that is not, we should be clear, it's not a prescription because that's not actually legal. It is a certification. And so the practitioners, in accordance with law, issue certifications, and there are rules around what qualifies one uh, to be a practitioner and rules around what qualifies one to receive the so-called card to be certified. What we've seen 
And uh, this is kind of what prompted us to give you a call and come in the studio. What we've seen is some uh, some organizations that are promoting that they could actually issue these cards, but these organizations are not inside the state. And uh, it seemed to be a little misleading on how that works and what's involved in that. Uh, t- tell us about what you know about that, and, and then uh, please describe Again, the the process, what is legal? What is the legal procedure to receive a card? So, first of all, there's there's not going to be any product available to be purchased until late 2022. Okay. So, we're talking you know, November, December. So, if anybody's trying to sell you cannabis in any form between now and then, um, you know, you better you better be very very skeptical cuz okay. it's probably black market. Um uh, a card, uh, once you get certified by a practitioner, a card's going to cost you $25 from the Department of Health, and a, and that's going to be valid for a year, and then you'll get a new card the next year, assuming that you get another you know visit from your practitioner, get another certification, $25 for a another card. So um, if someone's advertising on that they will do something for $200, you know immediately that a card costs $25. If someone's uh, doing something from out of state, you know, that, that has nothing to do with our medical cannabis program. So all of these people are scammers, and I believe that, you know, there is a seventh level of Dante's hell that is reserved for people like this who are trying to take advantage of, of the public. So, you know, nothing is going to be happening super fast this year once the people can start applying for a license whether that's a practitioner or a cultivator or processor or tester or disposal destruction or transportation entity, once they begin uh, applying, which will happen somewhere around June the 3rd, I believe that's 120 days from the passage, which was February 3rd or February Mm -hmm. 2nd. Right. So they can apply. Then uh, the Department of Health has 30 days um, to accept or deny uh, their application. And once they have made a determination to accept or deny it, then they have five days to issue their card. Okay. So and so, if they deny it, they have to tell them why. Hmm. So, but so that's going to go into July. Well, the dispensaries, the only place the public is allowed, the dispensaries can't even apply for a license until 150 days after passage, which is going to be somewhere around July 2nd or 3rd. I mean, okay. I mean, it's somewhere in that week, and so they will apply for the license again. They'll have 30 days to process this license. So here we go all the way to August before the dispensaries even know if they have a license. So we gave the cultivators and processors a 30-day head start so they could begin growing the plant. They could begin processing the plant uh, to get get ahead of the dispensaries because the dispensaries cannot sell anything that was not grown, that was not processed, that was not tested in the state of Mississippi. Okay. Anything that's in a dispensary has to have been tested by our Mississippi Department of Health. It, ha- it has to be tested by one of our testing facilities that's regulated by the Department of Health. Let me say it that way. Okay. Um, so it's, it is a, this program is very much a Mississippi-only program, and uh, anything that you see that's coming from somewhere outside our state is a, is a scam. Interesting. And maybe if it's coming inside the state, if it doesn't meet the criteria that yeah. I just mentioned. Yeah, gotcha. So the main thing is, folks, beware. And uh, so one of the things I want to ask you about, and this comes up uh, uh, just kind of anecdotally, is the, the concept of bona fide relationship with a physician. Is, is that ex- expanded upon and really uh, enumerated in detail? in the bill in the law itself or uh, how would you how would you describe what constitutes a bona fide relationship the the legal term bona fide relationship is one that was already currently in the law in other places and so it was something that we okay. could, we could anchor to to define a relationship where uh, a patient has an ongoing relationship with their physician that has not just begun and they are looking for continued ways to deal with whatever problem it is they have, whether it's their pain or it's their shaking or it's uh, whatever the case may be. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's 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 you're going to have to establish a relationship 
uh, that has been ongoing with a practitioner you know, that defines it as bona fide. Okay. I know you've been, uh, we got a break right here. You hang around? Sure. You've been to at least one event, right, um, where folks gathered to I went discuss. to the 3MA convention last week. Okay. We'll talk about that, and there's more events planned. Stay with us, folks. We're on Middays in the Element Well Studios. We've got Representative Lee Yancey joining us. All right, so, uh, Lee, off the air there, we were discussing, this This comes up a lot in, in the public. Uh, I see questions about advertising, promotion, and concerns about medical marijuana outlets uh, just promoting what they do and uh, taking up billboard space and running ads in uh, digital media and traditional on-air media such as radio and television and so forth tell us about the rules there so i I, number one i would i would refer everyone to the mississippi department of health website to look at the actual advertising regulations but just based on conversations that i've had i would say that the the regulations are as about as strict as they could possibly be Um, you can't do a billboard you know you can't uh you can't advertise really in 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 hardly any way you can't use a cannabis leaf on your advertising you can't say the word cannabis in hmm. your ab- advertising um you know if you have a, a hat you know just a hat that you wear uh you can't have the leaf on it hmm. and, and so um it's very 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 strict okay and and so one of the things I noticed last time I was in New Orleans, uh, down at the Sugar Bowl, is there's these big panel trucks that are traversing the roads there that, that are advertising and promoting the stores. What about that? So you can't do that. Okay. You can't do that. And, uh, you know, the dispensaries are the only ones that would want to have any kind of yeah, advertising. Right. The other places are going to want to re- remain anonymous. The sure. transportation vehicles that move it from place to place certainly want to be anonymous. Yeah. You know, um, so, you know, it's basically the dispensaries uh, that we're talking about. You know, they could, they could say, sponsor a hole in a charity golf tournament or okay. – um, but, but, again, this is medicine. This is not, you know, driving everyone to yeah. your – you know where you're selling widgets you know this is this is medicine and uh the the advertising needs to be strictly regulated and i think the department of health has come out uh with a very very strict uh program and it's one from which you can always uh loosen up as the years go by it's always harder to get more strict uh and it you know it's it's better to start out firm and then and then relax it than to start out very relaxed and then try to get more okay. strict the way Oklahoma has done yeah. they were so lax their program was out of control and um you know they ha- they're now coming in trying to add uh some features that would make it uh more controlled and 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 you know they've been suffering for years as a result of it mhm all right. So, and there's also, as I recall, some limitation even on the signage at the dispensary for the retailers, right? Sure. I mean, no, you can't have a cannabis leaf on your sign. Uh, you can't say cannabis, you know, okay. on the sign. Okay. Um, that's my understanding yeah. now. Uh, yeah. I, the the regs. I think the first set of regs they put out were 91 pages, and I will admit I have not read all 91, 91. pages. Uh, but I've but I've just heard conversations, you know, about it. On the ceasefire text line, a question: If I were a legal card holder, what would stop me from purchasing black market marijuana and using it? Well, number one, it'd still be illegal. Yeah. Number two, it would not have been tested, so you really don't know what you're getting. So nothing stops you. you. you the know, black market I mean, is a black you, market. You can go do it, but you you know you're going to go to jail if you get caught. Yeah. And. Um, you know, and you don't know what you're getting. You know, we, yesterday was a National Fentanyl Awareness yep. Day, and 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 you certainly don't want to get a hold of any cannabis that's been laced with fentanyl. And uh, if 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 you are a qualifying patient who's gone through the process and has bought your cannabis in a dispensary uh, that's been regulated by our program, you know that you're getting a tested product that doesn't have anything in it that's going to kill you. This question comes up a lot. I know Rhino and I have uh, addressed it numerous times, and it's the the uh, the situation with concealed carry permit or just purchasing a firearm in general. Uh, how does this affect that, and how does this play into that? 
So it's it's the same question that I've had for the last nine months, yeah. and I think I've I've, I've, <laughs> I've, I've I've answered it on here every time I've been on here. Yep. You know, you're going to give up some of your rights if you participate in the medical cannabis program. Mm -hmm. And if you are participating in the medical cannabis program, you have a debilitating condition that is debil debilitating. It is it is it is hampering your life to the degree that that you are desperate. And so if you already have a gun, if you already have a license, if you already have a concealed carry, then there's no problem. But if you go to buy a new gun, there is a form you have to fill out. And that form says, I attest that I have not broken any state or federal laws. Right. Well, the medical cannabis program, uh, you know, if you're participating in it, you are, you are complying with state law, but you are still out of compliance with federal law. Right. And we are the 37th state that has made an exception to the federal law. But if you if you tell the truth and you have a card and you sign and attest that you have not broken any federal law, you will be telling a lie. And so that's that's what it comes down to is you, you recognize you are giving up some of your rights if you participate in this program. If you go to work and you are participating in this program, there's nothing that prevents your employer from firing you. There's nothing that prevents them from giving you a drug test. There's nothing that makes them uh, have to continue to employ you. Uh, if you have cannabis in your system, and it will stay in your system a long, long time, long yeah. after there's any impairment. Yeah. So uh, you are giving up some of your rights if you participate in this program. Yeah. I think that the, there's a perception out there, I really would, would uh, describe it as a misconception, that if you go get a medical marijuana card, that that's going to be somehow cross-tracked to the fact that you also – um, have purchased a firearm and registered in that respect, and that law enforcement is going to show up at your house and take all your guns. They're not. I know. It's come up over and over and over again. It's incredible that, you know, how that's gotten so. But we have 34 or five other states to look at as uh, as an example, and that just hasn't well, happened. if you get prescribed hydrocodone, they don't come to get your gun. It's same deal. You're right. Yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, I think we just have a situation where it's it's such an oddity and maybe the only uh, scenario that I can um, think of where we have federal law and state law that are a bit in conflict. And uh, would you agree? Yes, and we'll continue to have these problems until the federal the, – the feds – decide to decriminalize it and and take it off of schedule, schedule one. one yeah, yeah. just so that's the way it is but i mean at this point it's fair to say they just kind of turned a blind eye to it and they they turn a blind eye in 2012 they issued a statement through the justice department saying that if states were in compliance with their own state laws then the justice department was not going to prosecute for uh those who were participating in a in a legal state legal uh, medical cannabis program, or some we have 17 or 19 states that are full-blown recreational marijuana programs, and you don't have the federal government, you know, stopping them, yeah, uh, because they've broken federal law, yeah. So it's just a conflict, and you know, and there'll always be a conflict until they change it. Same is true with respect to uh, banking and uh, r uh, relationships between the uh, really any of the industry, right? And, you know, we had the issue that, you know, TVA said they weren't going to provide electricity. Yeah, that's right. And then uh, then they changed their mind. Yeah. So, But a, uh, a dispensary, for example, really can't uh, obtain treasury, traditional treasury services from a financial institution. Is that correct? That's my understanding. Now say that one more time. Well, uh, a retailer really can't have the traditional uh, banking relationship with a um, – That is up to the bank. The, the bank or the financial institution would have to decide if, if that is um, – you know, if that is something that they would be willing to do. And yeah. there are some that are willing to do it, and okay. there are some that are not. So okay. you kind of have to bank shop to, okay. find, to find one that, that will. Gotcha. But uh, they're perhaps subject to some sort of citation but, or regulatory but, issue. But we inserted language in our bill from the Mississippi Bankers Association okay. uh, that basically said if, if they were in compliance with state law, then, then okay. that, that, you know, we did everything that we could okay. possibly do to gotcha. make them – uh, to give them some protections. Might have some po potential issue with uh, the controller currency, the bank regulators at the federal level. Don't know. How's that worked in other states? Are yeah. you aware? Well, in other states, they haven't had a problem. They have found okay. a way to do it. Okay. And that's, that's, that's the ingenuity of the human mind, that necessity breeds invention, and everyone finds a way to 
uh, conduct business and to, you know, provide this uh, medicine to those who who have those debilitating conditions. Yeah, it's it's another. I think it's just another example, and I, I keep thinking about uh, the creation of the Mississippi Lottery Corporation. Uh, those that were proponents of the lottery were disappointed because we were the 45th state. But on the other hand, we had 44 other states to look at, yeah. figure out what works, what doesn't, and how to avoid the pitfalls. And, and I know you and the senator and others as well. Uh, did a lot of work in that regard to, to well, research the other well, states. Well, we did, and we looked for best practices. But, sure. you know, it, but, you know, we had already had a ballot initiative. Yeah. We'd already had 74 percent of the people say they wanted some type of medical marijuana program. Yeah. So we felt like there was a mandate to do it and that we couldn't stop it from coming. It was coming one way or another. Yeah. And this was our chance to do it where we could tax it and test it and regulate it and make sure that it was it was as safe as it could be. Yeah, very insightful. Appreciate you coming it on, Representative It, it was our bite at the apple, and we took it. Absolutely. Yep. I understand. Thanks for coming on. Yes, sir. Thank See you. See you soon. All right. Appreciate it. We'll take a break right here on Middays. We'll come right back. <laughs> 